WNYC Studios. From WNYC in New York, this is On the Media. I'm Bob Garfield. And I'm Brooke Gladstone. On Thursday evening, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld the stay on President Trump's travel ban, as in, no travel ban. In response, the president tweeted in all caps, See you in court. The security of our nation is at stake. Now the case will likely go to the high court. It's the next chapter in a judicial page-turner that opened last Friday when federal judge, or in Trump parlance, so-called Judge James Robart, blocked the administration's Muslim ban and enraged the president. He tweeted, What is our country coming to when a judge can halt a Homeland Security travel ban and anyone, even with bad intentions, can come into the U.S.? Just cannot believe a judge would put our country in such peril. If something happens, blame him and court system. People pouring in. Bad. One could write all of this off as just another manifestation of his tweet reflex, but members of the judiciary weren't having it, including Supreme Court nominee Neil Gorsuch, who shared his anxiety with Senator Richard Blumenthal. He certainly expressed to me that he is disheartened by the demoralizing and abhorrent comments made by President Trump about the judiciary. It's rare for a Supreme Court nominee to speak disparagingly of his nominator. Yet according to Blumenthal, desperate times call for desperate language. We're careening, literally, toward a constitutional crisis. Constitutional crisis? Blumenthal's alarm on Thursday capped a week of media debate over whether Trump's disregard for governmental norms means we are in the midst of this esoteric legal term. There are some judges who are suggesting that that's possible, that America might face a constitutional crisis. It's not clear over exactly what. There are many senior Democrats who believe that Donald Trump is trying to precipitate a constitutional crisis through this aggressive assault on the judges. So are we in one or not? Will we know when it hits? What does constitutional crisis even mean? Legal scholars quibble over the niceties of a definition. Oh, sure, you can define it backwards, forwards, and sideways. That's Adam Liptak, Supreme Court correspondent for The New York Times. I would say we are in a constitutional crisis if one of the branches goes way outside of its lane. It will come in the form, most likely, of a court giving the administration a definitive, unambiguous instruction that the law requires it to do X, and then the administration does not X, and then we've got problems. Like the potential episode we avoided last week, following reports that Customs and Border Patrol officers were continuing to detain people under the ban in violation of the emergency stay issued by Brooklyn Judge Ann Donnelly. There was a fear on Saturday night in America that Judge Donnelly's order would be defied by the president, that the president would then order the executive branch to overrule the judicial branch, something the president has absolutely no right to do. And at that point, the Constitution would have broken. Yikes. Part of the term's ambiguity stems from the lack of true historical precedent. The worst-case scenario hasn't happened yet. For instance, in 1957, when Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus sent the Arkansas National Guard to bar the Little Rock Nine from entering a newly desegregated high school, President Eisenhower ordered soldiers to escort the students in. Directing the use of troops under federal authority to aid in the execution of federal law at Little Rock, Arkansas. This became necessary when my proclamation of yesterday was not observed, and the obstruction of justice still continues. Forbes's troops ultimately stood down. Constitutional crisis averted. In 1832, there was another near crisis when the Supreme Court under Justice John Marshall ruled that Georgia law could not be used to seize Cherokee land. President Andrew Jackson briefly threatened to ignore the ruling and taunted the courts with the famous, if apocryphal, words, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. The courts didn't have an army then, and they don't today. With neither purse nor sword, 
the court relies on its mystique and the White House to enforce its rulings. So, when Trump questions the authority of federal judges and preemptively blames the court for future terror attacks, he sends real tremors through our delicate system of checks and balances. But it's not a constitutional crisis. Yet. So, Adam Liptak suggests that we deploy the term with care. I think we're much closer to one than anybody a couple of years ago would have envisioned. I don't think we're terribly close, but we've moved in that direction rather faster than anyone should feel comfortable with. And what happens when you have a constitutional crisis? (laughs) Nothing good. You know, I mean, lots and lots of developed democracies revise, throw out, start over. And that is within the realm of possibility, I suppose. Cheerful words from Adam Liptak, who covers the High Court for the New York Times. Coming up, another constitutional issue, free speech, and how to enforce it, block it, or simply manage it on the streets of our cities. This is On the Media. Hey, this is Jad from Radio Lab. We're having a, a, a we're celebrating a little milestone over here at Radio Lab. We have been doing this. We've been making stories for the podcast for the radio for fifteen years. That is fifteen years of stories about like um, I don't know the science of morality, the metamorphosis of butterflies, the legal foundation for the war on terror. All these different stories. We've been doing it for fifteen years. So check out our latest episode out of the archives, and all of our episodes are available wherever you get your podcasts. This is On the Media. I'm Bob Garfield. And I'm Brooke Gladstone. Now we shift the focus from the courts to the streets. You may have noticed there have been a lot of protests lately. Take February 11th, for instance. Plans for a candlelight walk against the Muslim ban in D.C., a Resist Trump rally in San Francisco, Colorado stands with Planned Parenthood in Denver, defund Planned Parenthood rallies across the country, a smorgasbord of protests in New York City against Trump, mass incarceration, and fur. But some local and state governments have pushed back against such exuberant, ubiquitous political expression, which of course has been mounting for months. Protesters fill the streets of Milwaukee upset over Donald Trump's victory in the presidential election. Protesters demonstrated at the State House in Raleigh Friday as the outgoing Republican governor, Pat McCrory, signed the first of several measures limiting the powers of his soon to be predecessor, successor, Democrat Roy Cooper. Standing Rock protests have been taking place all around the country as advocates fight to keep the pipeline from being built on tribal land in North Dakota. The move to restrict speech in the street has come almost entirely from the political right, in the name of law and order. In North Dakota, legislators have proposed a law that would indemnify drivers who negligently hit protesters on the highway. In Washington state, they've proposed upping the charge for some forms of civil disobedience to a felony. All in all, at least 10 states have pushed forward legislation to increase the cost of exercising your First Amendment rights. Lee Rowland is a senior staff attorney with the ACLU's Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project. Lee, welcome to OTM. Thanks so much for having me. Give me a rundown of some of the proposals, please. Well, you've mentioned uh, some of the proposals that have already rightly been met with national ridicule, including the bill in North Dakota that would literally excuse a driver of vehicular manslaughter if the person they hit was a protester. We're also seeing a a somewhat ludicrous bill in North Carolina to ban heckling after the governor was apparently embarrassed leaving a dinner last year. And we're seeing a number of states dramatically increase penalties for obstruction, which can be something as simple as showing up to a protest, having every intention to obey the law, and being jostled to the wrong side of a yellow line on the side of a road. Are there ways that legislators can, in the name of public safety or anything else, actually curb lawful protest in a way that's not going to get them in First Amendment trouble? 
as long as obstruction bills, that is the kind of bill that would make it illegal for you to stand in the middle of the highway, as long as those are actually tailored to public safety needs and they are enforced neutrally, those laws are generally constitutional. But that's not what we're seeing with this wave of bills. Every single city and county in this country has an anti-obstruction ordinance. What these bills do is pile on draconian penalties. So for example, making it a gross misdemeanor or a felony to have your foot on the wrong side of the highway median or seek to charge you all the costs of a law enforcement response if you're one member of a protest that results in a need for a law enforcement response. So these are not what the courts generally consider to be tailored to public safety needs or other government interests that are neutral with regard to protest. Now you said they've been ridiculed, and they have, but that doesn't make them necessarily unpopular. There's a bunch of nods of approval that go with these legislative attempts, are there not? Well, there's no question that there are certainly legislators who find this to be a popular enough idea to see this kind of legislation spread like wildfire. But the good news is that once they are publicized, once people find out that legislators at the beginning of the state legislative session are making it a priority to penalize protest, there is pushback. Bills so far aren't making it through the legislative session as we might see if they were bills likely to ultimately pass. Is it my imagination or are all, I mean, all of these attempts to squelch First Amendment rights originating from the Republican Party, state by state, jurisdiction by jurisdiction? As far as I'm aware, every single one of the anti-protest bills that's been introduced this year has been introduced by a Republican legislator. And I think that's a shame, right? First Amendment rights should not be a party issue, right? One thing about the First Amendment is what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If Republican legislators think that they can introduce these bills and then only go after Black Lives Matter protests, they've got another thing coming. The First Amendment, if it means anything, means that the government can't pick and choose winners in political battles. I work at the national office now, but for many years I worked at the ACLU of Nevada. And while I didn't see a wave of anti-protest legislation like we're seeing now, from time to time, a bill would crop up that would increase penalties for obstruction or, you know, add the kind of draconian insurance or payback requirements that some of these bills we're seeing now would do. And not a single one of those bills ever passed. And one of the reasons was that as soon as these bills were introduced, also generally helmed by Republican legislators, Anti-abortion protesters would come to what they consider to be their Republican legislators and explain to them, this is going to make us a bunch of felons. Those bills tended to die a quiet death. Isn't it true that the First Amendment has become partisan? That it is perceived as the last refuge of a liberal scoundrel? You know, I, I don't think I can agree with that. Even as you're asking me that question, I'm getting bombarded with questions about the free speech rights, for example, of Milo Yiannopoulos, who was, by protesters, hounded out of his right to speak at Berkeley last week. This is the provocateur associated with the alt-right and uh, columnist for Breitbart. That's right. And it's not the first time that Milo has been prevented from speaking because of a liberal outcry. From where I sit, it's not clear to me that anyone owns the First Amendment, and nor should they, right? It's a complicated civil liberty that tends to be loved only by nerds like those of us at the ACLU for the exact reason that it protects your leftist greed just as much as it protects your right-wing ideology. I mean, the ACLU represented the Nazis' right to march in Skokie in the 1970s. So we certainly understand that, indeed, it's perhaps most important to stand up for speech you vehemently disagree with precisely because we don't want the First Amendment to turn into a popularity contest. All right, Lee, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Lee Rowland is a staff attorney with the Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project of the American Civil Liberties Union. Now, those who subscribe to liberal values are supposed to, quote, defend to the death the right not only of their friends but of their foes to speak their minds. But anti-fascist protesters, or as they're more commonly known, Antifa, follow a different path. Mark Bray is a visiting historian at Dartmouth College and the author of Translating Anarchy, the Anarchism of Occupy Wall Street. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Tell me about the origins of anti-fascism. When it first began, I assume back in the 20s? 
Sure. Well, anti-fascism is as old as fascism. And so certainly in the 1920s and the 1930s, as fascist regimes in Italy and Germany started to gain political prominence, a number of left political groupings, socialists, communists, anarchists, started to organize really primarily self-defense units initially because part of the Nazi and the Italian fascist modus operandi was to organize these paramilitary units that would terrorize their left opponents. And so the different communist parties and socialist parties would organize their own anti-fascist militias, one of which was called Anti-Fascist Action, the first group to use the name that's now become common for anti-fascist organizations around the world and the derivation of the shortened term Antifa. Moving into the 1930s, Spanish Civil War and the struggle against Franco spread anti-fascist organizing around the world. And then in the 1980s and 1990s, you have a rebirth of anti-fascist organizing, especially starting in, in Britain, in Germany, as neo-Nazis started to target migrants and other marginalized communities. And what we see today is the spread of that to the United States and beyond. Now, one of the most frequently cited actions in Antifa history is what's referred to as the Battle of Cable Street, right? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Talk about that, because it does begin to set the stage for what we're seeing now. It certainly does. In 1936, the leader of the uh, British Union of Fascists, Mosley, organizes a march of a couple thousand fascists through the east end of London, which is a predominantly Jewish neighborhood. And so in response to that, a whole group of leftists and Jewish residents of the area and other ethnic minorities organized a militant demonstration against this fascist march. How many? Between like 15 and 20,000 people. This was a massive response. The police did what they could to defend the fascists from the anti-fascist demonstrators, but ultimately were overpowered. The fascists had to cancel the march and essentially back down. And so this Battle of Cable Street is really an emblematic example of anti-fascist politics put into practice in terms of preventing fascists from marching through a Jewish area. But not just that, right? Antifa is fundamentally against the right of fascists to speak and be heard. That's entirely correct. So in your open, you mentioned the popular slogan that liberals have adopted from Voltaire that I may disagree with what you have to say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Mm -hmm. Anti-fascists fundamentally disagree with that premise. They argue that given the horrors of Auschwitz and Treblinka, the destruction that Nazis have caused, that fascists, white supremacists, should not be granted the right to express their ideas in public, in part because, they argue, had that been done early in the 1920s or the 1930s, we may have been able to bypass what ended up happening. I get that as a tactic, but I'm still not sure how the philosophy of anti-fascism squares with the liberal values of free speech and open dialogue. And I guess it doesn't. To some extent, it doesn't. The question is, if we want to prevent something along the lines of what happened in the 1930s and 40s from happening again, how do we do it? And the liberal prescription for doing it is essentially free and open debate and dialogue. And if Nazis do something illegal, then hopefully the police will stop them. Anti-fascists recognize that in the 1930s, 1940s, the police supported fascism. The fascists didn't actually stage a revolution to come to power. They worked within the political system. And all the reasonable dialogue and debate that one could muster did not do the job. The argument is that if we want such a horrific crime to not reoccur, it needs to be nipped in the bud through a variety of tactics, but one of which is through violently disrupting Klan rallies, neo-Nazi speeches, and, and so forth. And the other thing to remember is that anti-fascists identify as communists, as anarchists, as socialists, and want to really organize for a revolutionary rupture with the prevailing political system, and then this is in line with that. So that's also another reason why the two philosophies don't quite jive. So the liberal idea that in a marketplace of ideas, the good ideas will rise to the top and the bad will drop out the bottom. They don't buy that. You don't buy that either? Well, unfortunately, terrible ideas have risen to the top throughout history. The liberal ideal is that the government is a referee in a game that all parties are invited to play. But in actual fact, whenever left groups have become threatening, you get red scares, you get repression, you get COINTELPRO in the 1960s and 70s. And so essentially anti-fascists are arguing that we want a political content to how we look at speech in society, which is drastically different from a liberal take, and that this entails 
shutting down the extreme manifestations of fascism and neo-Nazism. And we need to recognize that this is not simply a question of whether a fascist government will come to power or not. I'm skeptical that such an explicitly fascist government would come to be, but that those who carry out hate crimes, they feel emboldened when their ideas become mainstream. And so the idea with anti-fascist politics is to prevent those ideas from having that opportunity. But where does it stop? I mean, how are we different from our fascist opponents if we both subscribe to the idea that speech should be repressed when when we regard the message to be dangerous. Germany has a prohibition against advocating for Nazis publicly. That doesn't mean that Germany is a closed society where people can't say whatever they want to say. You can have some prohibitions against speech without going all the way. In the context of an increasing number of hate crimes, the Southern Poverty Law Center cited over 800 such crimes immediately following the election of President Trump. The idea is that the people who carry out these crimes are listening to Richard Spencer speeches, going on Stormfront websites, imbibing this hateful doctrine, and that to the degree that we can shut it down, we will make fewer people copycatting them into attacking vulnerable populations. Most people would agree that it was acceptable in the 1930s and 1940s to organize armed resistance to the Nazi regime. The question is, how terrible does it have to be before that becomes legitimate? And the anti-fascist answer is, you need to nip it in the bud from the beginning. You wrote that, quote, liberals tend to examine issues of sexism or racism in terms of the question of belief or what is in one's heart. What is often overlooked in such conversations, you said, is that what one truly believes is sometimes much less important than what social constraints allow that person to articulate or act upon. Right. So the the message that I'm trying to get across with that is we have a certain set of societal taboos around what one can say and can't say, and those have shifted over time. The words that are acceptable to use about different ethnic minorities, about women, about all sorts of groups have shifted over time. And the way that I think that we maintain a firm barrier against the alt-right, making racism okay again, making sexism okay again, is to really increase the social cost of presenting oppressive views out in public so that when someone like Donald Trump says something sexist, we raise a ruckus, we disrupt business as usual to make it so that it's not acceptable to raise these views in public, increase the social cost of that being able to be a public discourse and push back through politics. So what does the American Antifa movement look like? What are its tactics? Under that specific banner, it's still relatively new and is finding its way. But a lot of anti-fascist or Antifa groups have formed in different cities around the United States. A lot of what they do is researching information on local white supremacists, who they are, where they live, where they work, sometimes pressuring their employers to get them fired sometimes making sure that if they organize private events at local venues for white supremacists, they pressure the venue owner to try and cancel the event. So that research and coalition building with groups that are affected by various forms of fascist or white supremacist violence is a lot of what's done. What gets more of the headlines is when the demonstrations come out onto the street. And so as I'm sure you and and a number of listeners are well aware, there have been high-profile instances recently, such as in Berkeley, of trying to physically shut down events that has raised the profile of anti-fascism. Physically confronting people, that's part of the strategy, right? Yes, it is. It's an illiberal politics of (laughs) social revolutionism applied to fighting the far right. In a recent article, you advocated for everyday anti-fascism. That is, anti-fascism that goes beyond, quote, punching Nazis. Right. So these glamorous topics, you know, the the video of Richard Spencer getting punched got millions and millions of shares. But if we want to think about how to create an anti-racist society, an anti-sexist society, we need to think about the everyday interactions that we have with each other at our workplaces, in our families, among our friends, and say, if someone is articulating a homophobic perspective or prejudicial against immigrants, am I doing what I can to try and change their mind? Am I raising some sort of opposition or am I tacitly going along with it because I'm just letting it slide? And so everyday anti-fascism is not having any tolerance for intolerance. It's not agreeing to disagree about hateful behavior. And it's saying, look, 
if you're going to be part of my life, you need to shape up. You can't treat people like this. You can't say things like this. And holding people accountable, and ultimately, sometimes that means you need to end some friendships, or it means maybe you should boycott the business down the street that's been rude to Latino immigrants. You say that our goal should be that in 20 years, those who voted for Trump are too uncomfortable to share that in public. Raise the social cost of being a bigot. And sometimes that's enough to make it so someone doesn't feel empowered to act on it in a way that that puts people in jeopardy. But there is a, a growing radical sector of the left in the United States that is simply not going to take any chances with the possibility of alt-right politics becoming the mainstream. We have a Breitbart editor and white supremacist in the White House. We're not that many steps away from a situation where a crisis unfolds, the Trump administration uses some sort of emergency authorization to centralize power. And so if we want to make it so that alt-right ideas are not taken seriously, the anti-fascist argument is that you don't even let them start to have that kind of platform in society. This is the norm of anti-fascist politics in Europe, where many people remember the legacies of living under the Franco regime, for example, in Spain, and see how it has affected them in their everyday life. And it's not something that classical liberal sympathizers will feel comfortable with. Or as Jack Schaefer refers to me, public radio talk show hosts. Or maybe, <laughs> maybe. But that is a, a growing response to... Uh, white supremacist presence that has grown in alarming ways in our country. Mark, thank you very much. Thank you. Mark Bray is a visiting historian at Dartmouth College and the author of Translating Anarchy, The Anarchism of Occupy Wall Street. In response to the many protests that have erupted in New York City over the past few weeks, the leaders of architecture firms and local urban planning nonprofits recently published an online letter to Mayor Bill de Blasio. Quote, We see a powerful opportunity to make strategic improvements to our public spaces that would make these vital gatherings of free expression safer, more effective, and even welcoming to all New Yorkers. Vishan Chakrabarti is an architect, a professor at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, and author of the book, A Country of Cities, A Manifesto for an Urban America. He signed on to that letter and says that with the mounting protests here, especially outside Trump Tower on Fifth Avenue, the city ought to rethink how it accommodates protesters. And of course, Fifth Avenue's been a mess, and many people, including our former transportation commissioner, have said pedestrianize Fifth Avenue. One of the most affecting lines in the letter for me was, if it were made a pedestrian space, at least the part of Fifth Avenue near Trump Tower, where people are protesting, that this would, quote, send a strong signal to show who you believe have rank, the people in the commons, not the dwellers of the penthouse. I mean, we do have a White House North situation. Pennsylvania Avenue, of course, is closed in front of the White House, both for security reasons, but also for this idea of public gathering. I think there's a way to do this so that people can really speak their voices, and I think it's extraordinarily important right now. So what were some of the recommendations in the letter? We had a number of recommendations, but one of the ones that I found the most interesting was this idea of networking our public spaces so that it wasn't just about Fifth Avenue. You could have coordinated activity across a series of public spaces in all five boroughs and that you could get information either through your smartphone or they have these new Link NYC terminals. These are places where you can charge your phone or get free Wi-Fi, little tiny hotspot. Exactly. Information flow is incredibly important. And you say that this is a nonpartisan effort all across red and blue states, but specifically in cities. This is much more of an urban phenomenon across the country, no matter where. Going back to the Greek agora, you have the village square, you have the town square. That's where people get together and actually talk about ideas and have arguments and debates. We live in a time in which we need much more political discourse in this country. If you want the revolution to be televised, you go where the people are and you go where the media is. You don't go out in the desert or the cornfield. Do we take public spaces for granted? I think what we take for granted is the idea that public space isn't just an amenity. It isn't just a place for an office worker to eat their sandwich at lunch. It also has to be the space for people to gather, debate, and have civil discourse. Well, if people take public spaces for granted, governments don't, do they? 
I mean, give me an example where the lack of a public space is specifically intended to thwart protest. The one that comes to mind is Riyadh, the capital of Saudi Arabia, and there's a place called Deira Square, which is clearly not a place where you could stage a workers' rights protest or a women's rights protest. It's meant mainly as a kind of stage set. It has a nickname called Chop Chop Square. A lot of pretty harsh corporal punishment does happen there. This is not, I think, what great city planning minds had in mind when they created public space. Doesn't part of a protest's impact lie in the fact that it's a little chaotic? If cities are streamlined for protest, wouldn't that diminish a protest's impact? I think it's not about streamlining so much. You know, about a third of Manhattan today is given over to cars. It's roadway. I don't think the government should have anything to do with the protests other than providing basically the infrastructure. And by that, I mean the physical infrastructure of the space, the virtual infrastructure of broadband where it's required, and of course, a police force that is working with peaceful demonstration in a way that is good for everyone. Where the protest goes from there may change very much depending on what's being protested and who's organizing it. And I don't think the government should have any hand in that. I found it fascinating and really, really smart that a lot of the Black Lives Matter protests have happened on highways. And that's because Mm -hmm. the construction of highways in this country has a very, very difficult history in terms of urban African-American communities, urban renewal, ripping through these communities and so forth. And so all of a sudden you see Black Lives Matter protests take over highways and saying, we're not going to use the nice dressed up public plaza that someone designed for us to do the protest. We're going to do it in a space that really impacted our community and where our voices will be heard. To me, this isn't a one size fits all situation. So what all of us wrote in that letter isn't meant to be the only place where demonstrations will happen. And the airport, I think, is a prime example. And so what would be the number one thing that you would advise any city to consider. To welcome this and not be afraid of it. For instance, in the design of parks, there's this thing called desire lines, where you might plant a bunch of grass, and you see where people are blazing a trail, and there's sort of a path of dead grass, because that's where most people are walking. And that's where you put the path, because you understand that's what people want to do. And it's sort of looking for those desire lines. It's saying, where are people gathering? How are they doing this? And how can you actually make it something that is just a natural part of the life of the city. You might not naturally think that an airport needs places where people will protest, but turns out that it does. (laughs) Vishan, thank you very much. Thank you. Vishan Chakrabarti is a professor at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture. He is an architect and author of A Country of Cities, A Manifesto for Urban America. Coming up, the breaking news consumer's handbook, protest edition. This is On the Media. This is On the Media. I'm Brooke Gladstone. And I'm Bob Garfield. Earlier this week, presidential press secretary Sean Spicer went on Fox and complained about the steady stream of protests against the actions of the new administration. It's not these organic uprisings that we've seen through the last several decades. That, you know, the Tea Party was a very organic movement. This has become a very paid uh, astroturf type movement. Let's be clear, there is no evidence to suggest that any recent demonstration was anything other than the genuine expression of concerned citizens. But, says David S. Meyer, sociology professor at the University of California at Irvine, claiming that protesters are bankrolled by outsiders is a standard political tactic. If you can make an audience believe that those who are turning out are paid, that they have ulterior motives, then you discredit them. Another way is to emphasize that they're crazy, that they don't know anything, they're ill-informed or radical, or that they're frivolous. They're there to listen to the concert, Pete Seeger or Bruce Springsteen, or meet dates. Dismissing protesters as paid, shallow, or even unpatriotic goes back decades. Here's Richard Nixon's Vice President Spiro Agnew in 1970. Will America be led by a president elected by a majority of the American people 
Or will we be intimidated and blackmailed into following the path dictated by a disruptive, radical, and militant minority, the pampered prodigies of the radical liberals in the United States Senate? And J. Edgar Hoover in 1966. The Communist Party of America is doing everything in its power to steal the minds and the souls and the hearts of our young people. They have never worked so feverishly as they have in the last two years in some of our colleges and institutions to enlist the youth of this country in the faith and loyalty to a foreign power, the Soviet Union. And those things are not limited to conservative criticisms of liberal demonstrators. David Meyer. People said the same thing about the Tea Partiers, that the Koch brothers were supporting them all. So, paid protesters, a classic ruse with little basis in reality. And it's one of many tropes you should keep in mind when rallies make headlines. Here's another sure thing. TV coverage of protests will always fixate on mayhem and the flaming trash can, the smashed window, whether or not that represents the overall nature of the event. Police made arrests after crowds began breaking windows and lit garbage cans and a limo, as you can see there, on fire. When you have a large demonstration, there aren't any bouncers. There's nobody working the door. Somebody coming in with a Molotov cocktail, a racist sign, that's kind of de rigueur. And when you see coverage of a demonstration that emphasizes either the peaceful, sincere protester or the garbage can on fire, you should be mindful of the outlet that's portraying that image. You can do an apparently objective report on a single aspect of a story, let's say a burning limousine, but the very choice of that story is itself subjective and perhaps distorting. Absolutely. You know, when the Tea Party was going on, there were certainly racist signs at some of the demonstrations. How prevalent were they? During Occupy, there was a picture that went viral of somebody defecating on a uh, police car. I believe that really happened. I don't believe that was emblematic of the big diverse movement. I want to know about the violence, but I also want to know about how prevalent it was, and I want to know about the relationship of the people who threw bricks through a Starbucks window and the actual organizers of the demonstration put disturbing events, whatever they might be, in the picture but contextualized. One man's protest is another man's riot, although they're actually not the same thing. Around Franklin Square, scene of Friday's Inauguration Day riot involving hundreds of protesters, the aftermath today left many shaking their heads. There's so many people on the other side of the political aisle who just were not going to be happy. Those who are, you know, protesting and near rioting in the streets, those at the airport, so on and so forth. What you call something reflects your view of that thing. We still have arguments in Southern California about the Rodney King riots or the Rodney King rebellion. And you have to understand that when somebody's giving a label to an event, they are trying to change the way you understand that event. Now, hold on, because sometimes simultaneously there is a principled political protest and associated vandalism that is perhaps wholly untethered from the underlying issue. How should consumers best understand that duality? Consumers should see whether there's a long tether or no tether or a very short tether between the people who are being disruptive and violent and the people who are trying to make political claims. Remember, people show up to sell sodas and make money. People show up to just act out, and that's why it's important to provide fuller pictures. For obvious reasons, there's often a focus on numbers, which itself gets very political and contentious. The D.C. Homeland Security director estimates that the Women's March crowd exceeded 500,000 people. In D.C., uh, about 600,000 people uh, were there. Some say as many as 800,000. Should we not think about numbers at all? I think it's really useful to think about numbers, but I think you have to be suspicious of just about every source. The Park Service stopped providing numbers about 20 years ago after the Million Man March, which maybe was 600,000 or maybe was 1.6 million. 
Sometimes television networks hire people to take aerial photographs and count grids and multiply, but I guess it's expensive and then nobody believes the numbers anyway. So I think what you want to do is look at characteristic distortions up or down, and I think you want to compare the turnout to similar demonstrations on similar issues. So one great thing the anti-abortion movement has given us is annual demonstrations on the anniversary of Roe versus Wade so you can compare turnout over time and see the salience and urgency of that cause. Activists are paying attention to that. You know, the Tea Party stopped having tax day marches because they turned out to be so small. The grassroots wound up being pictures of grass. <laughs> <laughs> One weird little wrinkle about the coverage of large protests is what you call the cleanliness coda. Washington is getting, uh, is, is kind of worn out from all the demonstrations and the crowds, the trash that all these, uh, these groups leave behind. The signs are uh, probably alone are a lot. If you have a half a million people in Washington, D.C., I bet most of the trash cans are going to be filled up. So if you focus on the scraps that didn't make it into the can, then you're saying that the demonstrators are irresponsible and careless and selfish. If you focus on, wow, they cleaned up after themselves. Everybody was carrying plastic bags and taking stuff home. Then you're focusing on responsibility and you're kind of valorizing the protesters. I have never seen a large demonstration where some garbage wasn't left behind. I have never seen a large demonstration where there weren't lots of people carrying plastic bags trying to pick up. It's a question of focus. Alarming stories about the state of the climate over many, many years have created a sort of fatigue. Ugh, melting ice caps. Don't we already know this? Protests are variously inspiring or infuriating to the public. Does everyone get tired of them, too? Is it sustainable? It is hard to stay engaged. And media contribute to this fatigue because if you turn up half a million people in Washington, D.C. for a women's march, what does it take to be newsworthy the next time? There's going to be a science march within a week of a climate march. Maintaining the capacity to escalate and get attention is extraordinarily difficult. One of the odd things that's happening in this presidency, however, is that the president's helping a lot. The uh, smart political move of any president, when people turn out to demonstrate against your policy, is to praise the diversity and tolerance of the United States and announce that you're going to try to look out for everyone. It's astonishing to me that the current president hasn't been able to learn that script. It's axiomatic that if you can't take pictures of it, as far as the TV news is concerned, it practically didn't happen. How should this axiom inform our understanding of the general state of dissatisfaction? The cliche is always that an iceberg is nine-tenths underwater. You have to know that whenever there's a demonstration, there are tons of people watching on TV, downloading photos on social media who are cheering for it and are ready to do other things. And it takes months and months to mobilize those people. So the coverage of a demonstration is 300,000 people showed up in front of the Lincoln Monument and then they went home. Well, responsible, effective journalism tells a deeper story which talks about the grievances that those people are expressing and where did they come from? How did they get there? What are they going to be doing next? Another common trope here is that people who are protesting don't do anything else. They're protesting when they could have turned up at the polls. Well, in real life, the people who are protesting are probably the very same people who did turn up at the polls, who did knock on doors for political candidates, and some of them even gave money to candidates. We're talking about the nuts and bolts of protests, but did they really matter? Do they ultimately ever change our politics? Not by themselves and not necessarily in the short run. 
it's quite likely that these large demonstrations in Washington, D.C. and the airport protests are going to be followed in short order by political defeats. But in order to execute those policy gains that the movement views as defeats, the Trump administration is going to spend political capital. They're going to strain political relations with their own allies. And you often see the impact play out over long periods of time. So, for example, in 2009, the Tea Party focused on stopping Obamacare. There were big rallies, disruptive town hall meetings, and in the short run, they lost. Obamacare was passed. But the Tea Party actually grew afterwards and were seen a president who's really the Frankenstein monster of the Tea Party now. So, yeah, protest matters, but not as quickly as the story mass media like to tell. And if you go into a bar and watch people drinking and watching a soccer game, you'll see them cheering and yelling about a run down the side of the field that didn't lead to a score. But it did tire out the opposition. It did reveal weaknesses in positioning, and it did set up another score maybe 40 minutes later. European viewers have some sense of how that game works. Americans don't. David, thank you very much. Bob, it was a great pleasure. David S. Meyer is professor of sociology and political science at the University of California, Irvine, where he focuses on social movements. You can find the highlights of this conversation distilled into a breaking news consumer handbook protest edition at our website on themedia.org. Earlier in this show, we mentioned the notorious alt-right icon and troll, Milo Yiannopoulos. He's the guy who was banned from Twitter for serial harassment of actress Leslie Jones, the guy who sells shirts that say, feminism is cancer, or most recently, the guy whose speaking engagement at the University of California, Berkeley, led to massive protests. Police say there were about 1,500 people who turned out last night to protest Milo Yiannopoulos coming to campus. Those protesters calling him racist and sexist. Broken windows, uh, barriers broken, fire on campus. Fiery protests block a Breitbart editor's speaking engagement at Berkeley, sending Milo Yiannopoulos to safety instead of the stage. About an hour after a group of anarchists started inciting violence and destruction of property, the university canceled Yiannopoulos' speech. Victory for the protesters? Maybe. Victory for Milo and his online band of merry misogynists? Absolutely. Post-protest, pre-sales for his book, Dangerous, skyrocketed. And the previously niche hate monger, was everywhere. People were bleeding, people were beaten, um, you know, all sorts of things happened to people who just showed up, not all of whom were fans of mine, but just who wanted to come and just listen to what I had to say, you know, and those people were, were, were attacked, physically attacked, right? This is political violence in response to perfectly mainstream opinion. According to Ryan Holiday, author of the book, Trust Me, I'm Lying, Confessions of a Media Manipulator, the whole thing was a trap that we should have seen coming. In fact, he says, the Berkeley protests are a textbook example of how not to fight trolls like Milo. And he would know Milo appears to be following Holiday's textbook, which recounts his own intentional demonization of his own client, a guy named Tucker Max, who wanted publicity, any kind of publicity, for his book about drunkenly seducing women. You wrote, the textbook on media manipulation. Take us on a walk down manipulation lane. I mean, I think the one that's most similar to what we're seeing now with some of the members of the alt-right is that when Tucker independently produced a movie based on his book, we thought, okay, how do we get people to see a movie about this? And one of the ideas we came up with is perhaps the best way to get young men to do something is to have someone else who is not a young man tell them they should not be allowed to do that thing. And so what we ended up creating was a very real national boycott of the movie, a uh, controversy that rippled into the editorial pages of newspapers across the country. There were protests on college campuses. 
Uh, advertisements were were vandalized. Now, I did some of the vandalization myself and sent pictures to blogs. We made deliberately offensive advertisements. You know, we called in some of the complaints. But what you're really doing is sort of inciting that internet mentality of, oh, people are doing this, I want to join in. And it became a, a very real thing. You make no bones about being a marketer. But your method of marketing is built on disparaging the product itself. The ultimate expression of the idea that I don't care what they say about me as long as they spell my name right. That is exactly right. So typically you want a product that's so good that people recommend it to their friends and you don't really even need to do any marketing. Well, if that can't happen, and I think that's true for a lot of these alt-right ideas, what you exploit then is what's incendiary or offensive or awful about them, deliberately attracting the attention of the people who hate what you do and get them to denounce you as loudly as possible, knowing that each time they do so, if nine out of 10 of the people that, that hear it hate you, but one out of 10 hear about you for the first time and are open to the ideas, you have made a new fan. It's a jujitsu move, really. You're using the weight of a, an outlet or a public figure against them to recruit for you. You're now trying to be part of the solution. You're like the addict who goes to the middle school assemblies and says, kids, don't be like me. Yes, it's, it's scared straight. What that Yiannopoulos has done strikes you as being sort of torn from the pages of your book, Trust Me, I'm Lying. He finds the people who, when he pisses them off, they make the loudest amount of noise. And then you continue to hit that group over and over and over again with things that it's almost too much for them to ignore. And there is not a better place for a provocateur to go if they want media attention than from college campus to college campus. You know, sort of very politically correct, very online driven, very activist driven. To go from campus to campus with something you call the dangerous faggot tour is in and of itself a brilliant media provocation. And, and he has been rewarded for that in many ways already. Your cynicism and that of Yiannopoulos would be irrelevant if the media weren't there dependably to cover the reaction to incendiary, hateful, ignorant comments. Could Yiannopoulos be a thing if it weren't for the complete inability of the media to resist a uh, controversy? I think that is the most uncomfortable thing for people to hear. A story about someone who invokes a polarizing reaction is exactly what a publisher wants in a world where no one subscribes to their specific outlet, but in fact only finds out about it if it is shared widely on social media. So we have this reciprocal dance where one person makes a move and then the other person writes about it because they know that that person is a reliable traffic get because that's good for their bottom line as well. There's a wrinkle to the Berkeley episode, and that is that when the university shut him down over you know, presumably public safety concerns, he got to come out as a First Amendment martyr. D did you have to stand up and, you know, give him an ovation for having mastered the art of provocation? I certainly appreciate and acknowledge the strategic success there. I mean, when you try to suppress someone else's speech, especially on a college campus that's supposedly about these safe spaces and protecting people, when you march in mass to prevent a gay immigrant conservative from speaking about whatever they want to speak, you are ceding the moral high ground and is fundamentally undermining any credibility your argument should have with normal, reasonable people, especially the people in the center who I think are the swing vote on these things. All right. So you wrote the handbook. If you were to write the handbook for those trying to, you know, shut down ugly provocateurs before they even get started, what would that look like? It's interesting. You know, the word that I see thrown out there the most, the thing that people are somehow afraid of, they're, they're afraid of normalizing all of this. But I actually think that's exactly how you should be thinking about it. You've got to remember that particularly to the audience that a lot of these groups appeal to, being told that something shouldn't be allowed, that it's forbidden, that it's 
it's an offensive truth, is what makes it appealing. So you are showing the, the followers, the, the members of this mob, that, oh, they have to shut us down. They have to use violence because we're on to something. If you think the ideas are so preposterous and so embarrassing and illogical, the best thing you can do is let them speak, to let the ideas fight in the arena of ideas, not to prevent them from being shown because it tends to have the exact opposite effect. Let's move from offensive truth to offensive untruth. As you survey the tactics of Steve Bannon and the president, uh, do you see any of your own fingerprints on that, or is there, are we witnessing a different kind of manipulation altogether? I, I don't know, and I'm not totally sure if I would put the two of them in the same camp. But I do think they have both grasped that outrage is a blinding, irrational emotion. And if you can provoke it in your opponent, it so knocks them off their block that you have free reign to do whatever you want while they try to comport themselves. You've sort of seen this in Trump's campaign. It's just one scandal outrage after another. And I think the longer game there is that eventually the opponent gets so fatigued, so gassed that they're out of it. And and that's my real worry when I see this outrage machine going 24-7 over big and minor things alike is that there's no prioritization, there's no clarity, and, and what is the end game there? Ryan, thank you. Thanks for having me. Ryan Holiday is editor-at-large for The Observer and author most recently of The Obstacle is the Way. That's it for this week's show. On the Media is produced by Mira Sharma, Alana Casanova Burgess, and Jesse Brenneman. We had more help from Michael Lowinger, Sara Kari, Leia Feder, and Kate Bakhtiarova. And our show was edited by Brooke. Our technical director is Jennifer Munson. Our engineer this week was Terrence Bernardo. Katya Rogers is our executive producer. Jim Schachter is WNYC's vice president for news. Bassist composer Ben Allison wrote our theme. On the Media is a production of WNYC Studios. I'm Brooke Gladstone. And I'm Bob Garfield. Support for On the Media comes from the Overbrook Foundation and the listeners of WNYC.